Good morning and welcome. I'm Terry Kahn. I'm class secretary for PA 1965. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce my classmate, John Patrick. John's going to talk about the architectural history of Andover uh, in this first uh, session, which will last about 45 minutes. He's going to cover the first century, more or less. And then uh, following this, he's going to do another 45 minutes covering uh, the history of the buildings on this campus uh, up to about 1930. Um, I think you're gonna find it fascinating. He's done two of these talks on the institutional history. And uh, I've learned so much about uh, the school uh, that I never knew. And I, I think you'll find it uh, really rewarding. What you may not know, um, and this is a fun fact that it won't be included in his talk, John was the last person to join the class of 1965. He'd already graduated from high school. He had decided to, to go to a summer school session at Andover to prep for college, uh, and he fell in love with the place. And towards the end of that summer school session, he approached Bob Hulbert, who was then uh, uh, in charge of admissions and also running the summer school, and said, is there any chance I can go to Andover for a year? And Hulbert said, no, there's no chance. Someone would have to drop out at the last minute. And amazingly enough, someone did. John wound up joining us that September and fell in love with the place. And his passion, you'll see today. Uh, we are so lucky to have him as a member of this class. And the school is so lucky to have him as its historian. So with that, uh, John, take it away. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, I will not claim actually to be the school historian. There are people like David Chase who have a much better claim than that but I do my little bit and I really do enjoy it. So let me see if I can handle the technology and get us started here. There we go. And I'm seeing uh, us on the side here. If we could get rid of that also, it would be very helpful. I, I don't know whether that's on everybody else's screen, but I am seeing myself uh, and Terry on the side of this screen. Can we get rid of that? Well, anyway, I will proceed. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot again, Terry. And thanks to all you reunis and to others, uh, let me, uh, uh, there we go, that's better. Okay, now we're ready to start. Uh, thanks, thanks to all you reunis for joining us and to uh, other people who've joined us as well. I should also take a moment to thank my collaborator, Dick Howe, who took most of the current photographs that you're going to see. And I definitely need to thank Phillips Academy archivist Paige Roberts, who provided so much information and so many historical images from PA's invaluable archive. The archive is a tremendous resource for PA, and she's basically a one-man band, and she does a superb job. The two previous talks in this series narrated the general history of Phillips Academy from 1778 to about 1933. The two talks today are about the principal architectural styles employed on what is now the PA campus over that same period, including on the former campus of Abbott Academy. Unfortunately, there's only enough time to cover a handful of iconic buildings, plus a few others to illustrate specific styles. As usual, please bear in mind that the uh, meager one meg per minute upload rate of my home internet connection may sometimes slur my voice or delay the appearance of a slide. If that makes anything I say hard to understand, please feel free to email me for clarification at jjpatrick3 at yahoo.com. Also feel free to contact me at jjpatrick3 at yahoo.com 
if you have any questions about Andover architecture that don't get addressed this morning. The predominant style in England's American colonies was Georgian. The old state house in Boston, built in 1713, has the style's typical high pitched roof and flat gable ends, and they enclose a fully functional top floor lit by dormers. That was a typical attribute of the Georgian style. For a major public building like this, the Georgian style tended to provide a lot of ornamentation, as you can see. A Georgian college building like Harvard's 1720 Massachusetts Hall had fewer costly frills, but we still see raised string courses. Those are those raised sections that you see on the end, for example, and they also run across the front. So we also see uh, raised string courses encircling the building at each floor. There's a full balustrade on the high pitched gamble roof, and there's a parapet at the flat gable end. Originally, an arched hood also decorated each of the main doors. Now let's compare that to the federal style. Elements of the federal style began to emerge before the Revolutionary War, but its peak was the so-called federal period, the three decades following the establishment of the federal government in 1789. The federal style stripped away Georgian ornament to reveal a subtle interplay of basic forms and proportions and it lowered the roof line so as not to distract attention from that interplay. For example, on the mostly bare front of Bullfinch Hall, the three center bays, which that means the three vertical rows of window and door openings in the center, uh, the three, uh, let's see, where was I here? Okay, the three center bays uh, project very slightly from the main plane of the wall and are topped by a triangular gable end, which is called a pediment. This arrangement is called a pavilion. So that whole center section there, those three bays are what's called a pavilion because they project slightly from the building. It divides the facade visually into three symmetrical sections. Details focus our attention to the pavilion. The unique eyebrow window of the pediment has mullions like longitude lines. The arches of the second story windows have keystones and springer blocks, unlike the windows on the wings. You can see the window over there on the right is pretty plain. The windows in those center three bays in the pavilion are decorated only slightly, very subtly. The whole composition subtly draws our gaze to a center doorway framed by Doric columns and topped by a cornice and a prominent curved fanlight. The Academy's first permanent building, this was before Bullfinch Hall, was a federal style schoolhouse erected in 1786. These builders plans for the schoolhouse told a house right of the late 1700s all he needed to know namely its dimensions, its exterior appearance, the interior layout, and the truss work to carry the low hipped roof over a completely open second floor. A front door on the left opened onto a vestibule with stairs to the large second floor room used for public events. A central corridor led from the front door between two small breakout rooms to the main classroom at the end and the main classroom took up more than half of the ground floor. The floor plan of the next two academy buildings would be very similar. The small square in the main classroom at the building's center marks the only heat source, an iron wood stove. A metal stovepipe presumably ran up to the ceiling and over to the chimney on an outer wall. The primitive iron stoves of that time were more efficient than a fireplace, but that's not saying much. In one cold spell, the scholarship student who fired up the stove in the morning could not get the main classroom above freezing in time for class. From then on, he remained in the building all night to keep the fire going continuously until the cold weather abated. On September 2nd, 1807, the trustees of Phillips Academy accepted a deed of gift 
that became the constitution of the Andover Theological Seminary. So the board essentially became the board of both institutions. By 1821, the seminary had completed these three buildings around which a century later, Phillips Academy would construct its own new campus. Only the building in the center was designed by an architect. Scholars have pondered for years whether the seminary might have been modeled, uh, whether the other two, a uh, seminary might have modeled the other two buildings on some building or buildings at one of the colleges that then existed in New England. For example, there's Harvard. Lefelec Pearson, the Academy's founding head of school, was Harvard's interim president from the fall of 1804 to March 18, 1806, when he returned to Andover to help fund the seminar, found the seminary. We also know that representatives of the trustees visited Harvard in search of ideas for the seminary's buildings. However, scholars have always discounted anything at Harvard being the model for anything at Andover. None of the buildings in this famous 1767 Paul Revere engraving look like those the seminary later built. And those two U-shaped quadrangles look nothing like the seminary's straight row. Harvard did complete one additional building in 1805, a couple years before the seminary's founding, but it was a close copy of Hollis Hall, which is the large 1863 dormitory that you see at the back of the quadrangle on the left. Two of the seminary's three original donors were Samuel Phillips's widow, Phoebe Foxcroft Phillips, and his son, Colonel Samuel Phillips. In the seminary's deed of gift, they committed to fund two major public buildings, a three-story dormitory for 50 students and a two-story academic building to house a chapel, classrooms, a library, a dining hall, and steward's quarters. Colonel Phillips undertook to oversee the construction himself. He and Oliver Holden, the carpenter turned builder who was, this, who was his construction expert, visited Brown University in search of ideas in December of 1807. By then, financial reverses had forced the Phillipses to reduce their commit, commitment from two buildings to one. The remaining building would have to house almost all of the seminary's functions just like Brown's single college edifice, which we see here. This view of Brown in the year 1800 shows its building, later called University Hall, standing at the crest of a grassy slope. This may perhaps have inspired Phillips to locate the seminary's first building on a slight natural rise across a marshy meadow from what is now Main Street, but there's no specific evidence to substantiate that hypothesis. This is University Hall with its 17 bays, three front doors, and structurally significant pavilion are certainly not the model for the building Phillips and Holden eventually completed at Andover in 1809. Named Phillips Hall in honor of its donors, this building had a straightforward rectangular footprint, a simple hipped roof, only two front doors, and a mere 11 bays. The seminary's chapel and library were installed for the time being on all or part of the first floor and dormitory rooms filled the floors above. Classes seemed to have been held wherever space was available. In 1810, Colonel Phillips completed a small wooden building nearby to house the promised dining hall, kitchen and steward's quarters. In 1818, the chapel and library moved out to a new building and this building has been exclusively a dormitory ever since. It was renamed Falls Cross Hall in 1827. I'm very happy to announce today that I have discovered the building that served as a model for Foxcroft Hall. It was Harvard's 1805 Staunton Hall, which as I said before, was itself a close copy of Hollis Hall, which is seen here on the left. In this mid 19th century photograph, Staunton's slightly projecting center pavilion and cross gable makes it look nothing like Foxcroft. But the pavilion projects only very slightly 
So unlike that on Brown's college edifice, it has no structural significance, no real impact on the floor plan. It's an adornment. Far more important are the shape and arrangement of chimneys, the number of bays on each side, and the location of the doors. Staunton was built with six chimneys, two rectangular chimneys on each end and two squarish ones in the center. So was Foxcroft. Staunton had 11 bays on its long sides and four on its end. So did Foxcroft. The two doors on each of Staunton's long sides were in the third and ninth bays. So were Foxcroft's. My copy of the reference book entitled Architecture and Academe, College Buildings in New England Before 1860, identifies only one other New England college building other than Staunton with this exact layout. And of course, that's Hollis Hall to the left from which Staunton Hall itself was copied. Could the extraordinary similarity of Staunton and Foxcroft be just a coincidence? It's very unlikely, but it's not impossible. However, Staunton also had a structural flaw that no competent builder would repeat unless he had been told to use Staunton as his model. No builder who needs to tie a major interior partition into an outer wall would willingly put windows exactly where he needs to tie in the partition. How do you tie a partition into a window? Yet this old photo of Staunton shows that every window opening in the center bay is slightly wider than all of the other window openings. And this provides room for a wooden post in the center of the opening with a separate window on each side. The only explanation was that the builder needed the wooden post in the center to tie in a transverse partition dividing the interior of Staunton in half. And of course, each side of the partition is going to need its own window. It later occurred to me that I might find more about this in my copy of a scholarly work entitled Living on Campus, an Architectural History of the American Dormitory. On page 43, I found this plan of Staunton's first floor from the Harvard archive. As I predicted, it shows a massive transverse center partition, which was probably of brick, and the partition's tapering ends, which were probably of wood. And they do indeed tie into the window post in the center of the windows. Although this floor plan was not drawn up until 1874, the arrangement is clearly original. The bedroom all include two small carols to give each of its roommates a private place to study and pray. Staunton was the last dorm at Harvard and perhaps anywhere other than perhaps Foxcroft with this antique arrangement. Allworthy Hall completed only seven years later had suites that gave each of the two roommates a bedroom of his own opening onto a shared room for studying and socializing. By the way, the reason these survived all the way up to 1874 is that these little study carols or, or little closets you could go into to pray or study for, or whatever uh, were so small that they serve very nicely as walk-in closets for clothes. And they're actually labeled, I believe, coat closets in this, uh, in this uh, floor plan. Now look at the center bay of Foxcroft, just to the left of the tree. We see exactly what we saw at Staunton slightly larger window openings with a wooden post in the middle and a separate window on each side. Here they are in another old photograph. And here they are just a few days ago. The posts dividing the window, window openings were clearly for tying in a transverse partition that divided Foxcroft in half and required a separate window on each side. I ran my discovery by David Chase, who wrote the chapters on early Andover architecture in the Edison Gallery's excellent architectural history of the campus, which was published in 2000. At first, David dismissed my findings out of hand, citing his own previous research, which is only reasonable. But after thinking it over, he changed his mind. 
In fact, I'm delighted to say that this eminent scholar has even taken my discovery and run with it a bit in the Harvard Online Archive. So far, he's come up with the Staunton floor plan, which I already had, and he's also come up with a floor plan for Hollis Hall, but of course we already knew that it was going to be like Staunton because Staunton was a close copy. More intriguing was his discovery of a brief letter from the Harvard College Stewart to Lefelet Pearson on how to obtain skilled carpenters to build Staunton Hall and how much their materials would cost. The letter gives no indication, however, that Pearson was the man who made Staunton the model for Foxcroft. It's pretty well established by the visual evidence that Staunton was the model for Foxcroft. We can't be sure, this letter doesn't really tell us that Pearson was the person who carried this back to Harvard, uh, back to Andover rather. It merely shows him receiving the sort of report on Staunton's construction that we'd expect him to receive as interim president of Harvard. But it does suggest that yet undiscovered, undiscovered archival evidence may exist to support a Pearson hypothesis. And perhaps even that the end to end sighting of Hollis and Staunton at Harvard inspired Pearson to push for the end to end row eventually built in Andover. I certainly hope that David, with his superb talent for archival spade work, of which you'll see here some examples later on, can spare the time to see if such evidence actually exists. Fox Hoff, uh, Foxcroft Hall was shoddily built, perhaps due to the Phillips's financial problems. Its east wall required some rebuilding in the 1870s. In 1911, Foxcroft was declared unsafe. This time, all the east wall had to be rebuilt. It was also discovered that the foundation supporting the walls had been poorly dug and moisture seeping through the wall's inferior porous brick had rotted the ends of the massive beams supporting all of the internal structure. Strong pillars had to be installed to take most of that structure's weight off the walls. This may also have been one of, when one of Foxcroft's two center chimneys was removed in, in 1929, its entire fourth floor was taken off to conform to the height of newer buildings nearby and to improve fire safety. Mary's major buildings was designed by the famous Boston architect Charles Bullfinch, who would become the third architect of the U.S. Capitol in 1818. Bullfinch had only recently designed Harvard's Distinguished University Hall, completed in 1815. This three-story, 14-bay granite building served many purposes. Classrooms filled the three bays on each end, served by transverse corridors at the fourth and eleventh bays, where the doors are. The same corridors served first floor dining rooms in the uh, dining halls rather in the middle of the building, as well as a high ceiling chapel above which filled both the second and third levels and was lit by the six arched windows at the center of the facade. Bullfinch emphasized the building's symmetry by using ionic pil uh, pilasters to frame the bays where the doors are. To help unify the composition, he provided a roof balustrade that spans the eight center bays plus a center cupola, but Harvard never built the cupola. The shed dormers that we see here are from a later remodeling. The seminary's equivalent of University Hall was Bartlett Chapel, donated by Newburyport merchant William Bartlett. Its chosen site just south of Foxcroft was in lower, on lower ground and had to be terraced to raise it to the same level. Completed in 1818, Bartlett Chapel finally provided the seminary with a two-story chapel room, three classrooms, and an ample room for the rapidly growing library. It wasn't easy to squeeze all that into a building only nine bays wide. Bullfinch placed the transverse corridors and the stairways behind the third bay, where you see the door on the left, with the classrooms to the left and the chapel to the right with the library above the chapel on the third floor. So the chapel occupied the right two thirds of the building essentially with the library above it. 
To give this unbalanced one-third, two-third interior arrangement the external appearance of symmetry that the federal style demanded, he balanced the real doorway on the third bay with a false doorway in the seventh and made both bays project very slightly forward. He also eliminated second story windows in the middle of the second floor to highlight the symmetry of the remaining two windows on each end. A partial roof parapet helped unify the composition like the balustrade on University Hall. And in this case, Bullfinch also got the center cupola he wanted. Bullfinch specified white marble for all the stone trim to maximize its visual effect and thus emphasize the building symmetry. The stone work included the lintels and still, sills of every window, the columns that framed the doors, and the second story string course across the middle of the facade. However, Bartlett, the donor, insisted on cheap brown sandstone. He originally intended to paint the sandstone white, so it at least would have the appearance of marble. But after inspecting the columns for the doorways, he decided he preferred its unostentatious natural color. Unfortunately, at a distance, the brown stone became indistinguishable from the red brick, thwarting Bullfinch's intended effect. However, Bartlett never stinted when it came to basic quality. When the man supervising the bricklaying told him about the poor quality of local brick in Andover, he had wagon load after wagon load of good Newburyport brick hauled by oxen all the way to Andover Hill. The seminary's heavily remodeled Bartlett, uh, sorry, the seminary heavily remodeled Bartlett Chapel in the 1870s adding a large projection to the front with a new center, coupe, uh, center, center entrance and a tall Victorian bell tower. The remodeling also included gutting the interior and rebuilding it with two floors instead of three. This made it necessary to brick up all the second floor windows and place closed shutters over the brickwork to give the impression the windows were still there. After acquiring the seminary property, Phillips Academy moved Bartlett Chapel to its current location in 1922 and renamed it Pearson Hall in honor of Bartlett Pearson. The incongruous Victorian edition stripped off before the move. PA's first official school architect, Guy Lowell, then carefully restored the exterior to its original appearance, this time with a real working door in the seventh bay instead of a false one. However, the interior remained largely as it was, so Lowell had to leave the second story windows bricked up, and they're still bricked up today. The newly founded seminary's reputation for orthodoxy and intellectual rigor soon attracted many more students than Foxcroft alone could house. The trustees therefore appealed once more to Bartlett, who agreed to complete the seminary row with another dormitory. It was completed in 1821 and named Bartlett Hall in his honor. Bartlett Hall remains in its original location, but its interior was completely rebuilt after a 1914 fire and like Foxcroft, it had its fourth floor sliced off in 1929. I believe Bartlett was probably modeled on Union Hall or Berkeley Hall at Yale, neither of which uh, exist at the present time. But there's no time to go into uh, the, it, uh, the, the origin of Bartlett Hall now. I hope to give another talk laying out the entire story of discovering the origin of Foxcroft and I'll also give my reasons for linking Bartlett to Yale at that time. When Phillips Academy's wooden schoolhouse building burned down in 1818, the trustees replaced it with this building, completed in 1819. It, stood, it soon be, became known as the Brick Academy. By the 1830s, many had come to believe it was also designed by Bullfinch. So it was renamed Bullfinch Hall in his honor. But in the 1990s, David Chase found in the trustee ledger a payment of $15 to Asher Benjamin for, quote, plan of a CAD, unquote. 
The small amount probably indicated that Benjamin's plan was primarily for the building's exterior. The interior merely replicated the floor plan of the wooden schoolhouse on a somewhat larger scale. Consequently, the door we see on the near end was actually the principal entrance, while the one on the long side, although functional, was more for show. The vestibule and two breakout rooms would have been on the near side of that long side doorway, and the main classroom would have been on its far side. The second floor held the unusual, the usual large assembly room. Although less famous than Bullfinch, Asher Benjamin actually had much more influence on American architecture. In 1797, he created and published The Country Builder's Assistant, the first pattern book created by an American. Pattern books were architectural manuals or guides that provided instructions for builders illustrated with numerous detailed drawings. Written specifically for American builders, the seven different manuals Benjamin published in multiple editions from the 1790s to the 1840s left their mark on thousands of buildings throughout the United States. The content of Benjamin's manuals range from basic structural elements to decorative features, mostly derived from classical orders of ancient Greece and Rome. In this plate, for example, Benjamin's, uh, which is from a Benjamin's American Builder's Companion, the Roman Doric column on the right is not unlike the columns flanking the door of Bullfinch Hall. And in this portion of another plate from the same book, we see on the lower left an eyebrow window with longitude line mullions, much like the window we saw before on Bullfinch. Have you ever noticed that unlike uh, traditional PA buildings uh, elsewhere on campus, Bullfinch Hall has no chimneys? There don't seem to be any even in early prints and photographs like this that show Bullfinch as it was built. But if you look closely, you may just make out a tiny chimney protruding from the peak of the front gable. Another one protruded from the peak of the main gable in the back. They could be that minuscule because of how the Brick Academy was heated. Foxcroft and Bartlett halls were heated with traditional fireplaces, which required tall, ponderous chimneys because they were so inefficient. Most of the heat from a fireplace goes straight up the chimney, carrying with it fly ash and embers that could threaten flammable exterior woodwork unless the chimney were tall enough to carry them away. Pearson Hall was heated with expensive iron wooden stoves, which required only a single slender chimney at each end but the large stove installed in Pearson's double height chapel room seems to have heated it no better than the smaller stoves that had failed to adequately heat the academy's wooden schoolhouse. One account of a Sunday chapel service describes worshipers bundled up against the cold and also huddling over iron foot warmers into which attendants had loaded hot coals from the stove. A better alternative was at hand for the Brick Academy. A sea captain from Salem, Massachusetts, overwintering in the Russian port of Reval, now Tallinn in Estonia, obtained two ceramic models of the massive brick heaters known as Russian stoves, along with instructions for building them. Back in Salem, he sold the models and instructions to someone interested in building brick heating stoves. The trustees were therefore able to have two tall Russian stoves installed on the Brick Academy's first floor, each with its firebox facing into the main classroom and its back presumably facing into one of the two smaller breakout rooms on the other side of the center wall. Unlike an iron stove, which grows cold soon after the fire goes out, a properly built masonry stove absorbs most of the fire's heat and radiates it back gradually into the surrounding spaces for hours on end. A wood fire deliberately built to burn as fast and hot as possible could bring the temperature in the firebox up to as much as 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. A convoluted flue system like the one shown here 
would then absorb so much of that heat that the exhaust gases might have cooled to as little as 350 degrees by the time they reached the chimney. The brief hot fire also helped consume almost all of the flammable gases and embers long before they reached the chimney. And that's why the chimneys on the Brick Academy could be so small. Whoops, I have gotten things out of order here badly. Let's see. How did that happen? Okay, I'm gonna to have to skip around here a bit. This modern wood-fired brick heater gives you at least a rough idea of the mass of the Brick Academy's Russian stoves. It was built by Albie Barden of Norwich Walk, Maine, an expert builder of these devices to whom I'm indebted for explaining how they work. A well-built Russian stove in the early 1800s could easily achieve a thermal efficiency of 80% compared to less than 50% for an iron wood stove and at best 10% for most fireplaces. A modern masonry heater with scientific design features can easily achieve 90%. The Brick Academy was left largely empty after 1842, when the Academy consolidated all instruction in a newer and more conveniently located building known as the Stone Academy. By that time, the Industrial Revolution was rapidly improving iron stoves and reducing their price, destroying the market for Russian stoves, which had to be hand-built by skilled masons. In the 1860s, the trustees installed exercise equipment in the large second floor room of the Brick Academy to convert it into a makeshift gymnasium. In 1896, fire gutted the Brick Academy's interior but left the walls standing. Guy Lowell meticulously restored the exterior of its original appearance, recreating every feature right down to the long longitude line mullions of the eyebrow window in the front gable. Lowell also rebuilt the interior as the Academy's first permanent dining facility. The student dining hall shown here occupied the first floor. A banquet hall occupied the second. Lowell added a two-story wing in the rear to house kitchen facilities. Now, this recent photo shows how scrupulously he followed the workmanship style and partitions of the original block, uh, sorry, and proportions of the original block. So much so that only the slightly brighter color of its newer brick shows that it was added some eight decades later. When the new commons was completed in the early 1930s, the firm of Perry Sharn Hepburn made over the interior of Bullfinch Hall for PA's English department in an opulent colonial style based on the firm's work at Colonial Williamsburg. Some of the more recent commentaries on Bullfinch assert that it is really not the original structure at all, but just a colonial revival reimagination. That's certainly true of the interior, but Guy Lowell restored the exterior with rigorous attention to every detail of Asher Benjamin's original. The only things missing are the little chimneys, presumably because the dining hall conversion required removal of the Russian stoves. Before moving on, I need to correct a statement in my February talk that PA's unsigned portrait of Bullfinch Hall's principal donor, Lieutenant Governor William Phillips, with Bullfinch Hall in the background, could be firmly attributed to the famous painter Gilbert Stewart. In early March, David Chase sent me a copy of a memo that he had sub submitted to the Addison Gallery back in 2013 after discovering a payment to an unnamed copyist in the trustee records, along with a vote of thanks to Massachusetts Hospital for loaning their own signed Stuart donor portrait of Phillips to be copied. David's memo apparently got misplaced, so the Addison staff had no reason to question the longstanding attribution to Stuart, dated from well, dating from well before the buildings, uh, the paintings transferred to the transferred to the gallery. When I brought David's memo to the Addison's attention, Associate Curator of American Art, Gordon Wilkins, Wilkins told me that the Addison would now refer to PA's portrait as in the style of or after Gilbert Stewart, 
rather than firmly attributing it to Stuart. So I'm sad to say Bullfinch Hall probably doesn't appear in a Gilbert Stuart painting after all, but merely in a copy of a Gilbert Stuart painting. In the 1820s, Greek revival supplanted federal as America's most fashionable architectural style, with Asher Benjamin's pattern books helping lead the way. The new style was based primarily on the forms of ancient Greek and Roman temples. This photo of Brown University's heavy do heavily Doric Manic Manning Hall, completed in 1834, shows how temple-like a Greek revival building could be. This is actually modeled on a somewhat smaller ancient temple in Greece. Hipped roofs were out and gable ends were back, this time with pediments like those on ancient temples. This photo, the river entrance of Brown's 1840 Rhode Island Hall, shows how temple forms could be abstracted and adapted for use on a classroom building. Purely ornamental and somewhat abstracted Doric pilasters suggest columns supporting a simplified pediment above them. Unlike the federal style, which usually put the main facade on one of the building's long sides, as in Bullfinch Hall, the Greek revival style often put it on one of the ends, like an ancient temple. The Fourth Academy building on Chapel Avenue, completed in 1830 and commonly known as the Stone Academy, was Andover's first Greek revival building. However, its hipped roof and long side facade were still federal. By this time, iron wood stoves had become the standard source of heat because the Industrial Revolution had sharply reduced their cost. The Stone Academy's only prominent Greek revival features were the heavy cornices on the cupola and cornice top doorways like the one shown here. Double brick house built in 1829 is even less Greek, 18, yes, 1829 is even less Greek revival. Its only prominent Greek revival element is the recessed doorways framed by granite posts and lintels in homage to the post and lintel construction favored by ancient Greece. The straight row of window panes over each door is also Greek Revival. Andover Hill's finest example of Greek Revival was down on School Street, where Abbott Academy opened in 1829 in the most ostentatious classroom building yet built on Andover Hill, now known as Abbott Hall. Darn, everywhere. I'm not ready for it. Well, anyway, let's go on and see if uh, that's the one I'm looking for. Although its designer is unknown, it was the only building on the hill. We're talking about Abbott Hall. It was the only building on the hill at that time with a temple front portico. And it's still the only one with graceful ionic columns. In 1874, its well-proportioned form was disfigured by a dome set awkwardly atop its roof to house a telescope. This sort of addition poses the thorny question for historic preservation of whether to restore a building to its original form or to keep even an unattractive addition for its own sake or to show how the building evolved. But in fact, this dome is so important historically that one has to applaud the decision to restore it, restore the dome specifically a few years back. Installing a telescope at great expense when few schools of any sort had one showed that Abbott was no mere ladies finishing school, but dedicated from the start to giving young women a well-rounded education, whether they were going on to college or not. In, 1880, in 1888, Abbott Hall was moved from its original location facing School Street to its current site on the Sacred Circle and was raised atop a new lower story. A dramatic front entrance leading up to the original entrance, uh, sorry, a dramatic front staircase leading up to the original uh, entrance and a stone string course at the bottom of the first, at the top of the first floor, preserved the original building's visual integrity. It's unfortunate that the four-inch chimneys were taken off at some point after the move. 
This is indisputably the best Greek revival building on campus, but how much of it is actually Greek revival? The three part windows and the stone lintels above them, which are modeled on the lids of ancient Greek and Roman sarcophagi are standard Greek revival motifs. Nope, that's now we're gonna have to get back finally to that one that we saw before. There we go. The triangular rather than arched window in the pediment and the Greek key motif on the bottom of the beam that spans the ionic columns are also Greek revival. But almost everything else seems federal. The long side orientation, the hipped roof, and even these capitals, which are Roman rather than Greek. In the heyday of Greek revival, Andover Hill held fast to its roots in the federal period and merely dabbled in the current fashion. Oops, I'm going backwards instead of forwards. Let's uh, get back to where I need to be. There we go. This talk was also supposed to cover the Victorian buildings of the 1860s and 1870s, but it's now time for our scheduled break. So I'll cover those buildings instead at the start of my second talk, which begins promptly at nine o'clock. I hope you'll be able to join us then. Thank you very much.
Hmm. I'm hearing some uh, banging around in the background. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, it's probably somebody uh, who, who needs to mute. Okay, um, let's proceed. In this session, I'll need to cover more than 70 years of increasingly vigorous building in many architectural styles. That won't leave me time to say anything at all about most of Andover's buildings. I'm sure we all have our favorites, often for highly personal reasons, so I hope you'll forgive me if I fail to mention a favorite of yours. I'll be happy to discuss whatever building you wish after this presentation if you care to email me at jjpatrick3 at yahoo.com. I will be talking about Abbott Academy's Draper Hall in this session, and since I'm the first to admit my knowledge of Abbott is a lot sparser than I'd like, I'd also be happy to hear from any Abbott alumna who catches me saying something incorrect about Draper or wants to convey additional information about it. My email address again is jjpatrick3 at yahoo.com. We'll begin in 1864 when a fire destroyed the nominally Greek revival stone academy that we saw before where PA had consolidated all classroom instruction since 1842. The academy was perennially short of, of uh, cash throughout the mid 19th century. So the trustees had to take out a big loan to finance the hurried building of this much, much larger replacement. Servicing the loan would impede further development of the school's physical plant for nearly two decades. An incident that occurred half a century later also suggests that hasty construction and a tight budget may have led to some corner cutting in this new building, which opened in 1865. The architect was a recent graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute named Charles Cummings, whose devout congregationalist faith may have outweighed his lack of experience in the view of the trustees. This was the largest structure the academy had built to date, and its novice architect seems to have had trouble providing a, co a coherent exterior design to cover all the functions it needed to serve. The high basement accommodated laboratories. By this time, the slender end chimneys probably served coal stoves. Their location suggests four classrooms per floor, although the second floor had a chapel room as well. A huge assembly hall occupied the entire third floor under the mansard roof. Two additional classrooms later replaced the second floor chapel, so services moved up to the third floor, which became known as the chapel from then on. This closer view of the new building is by no means the only 19th century photograph showing academy students in places that would make the hair of today's administrators stand on end. Had this structure survived, Phillips Academy would now have the distinction of possessing perhaps the ugliest building of any major preparatory school. The long row of windows on the third floor, uh, uh, sorry, the long row of windows on the third floor's two front dormers, reminiscent of those on the Doge's Palace in Venice, indicate that Cummings had in mind the Venetian Gothic style made highly fashionable in this period by John Ruskin, England's foremost Victorian critic of art and architecture. Using light colored stone to make architectural accents contrast sharply with the brick walls is also a Venetian Gothic touch. But the Gothic belfry crowning the front uh, projection looks as if it belongs more on an English country church and the mansard roof is a French Renaissance feature that the second empire of Napoleon III had recently made newly fashionable. As if that were not enough variety, Cummings inserted square dental moldings typical of the Georgian and federal style above the Venetian windows on the front dormers. Such promiscuous mixing of styles was so common in the Victorian period that it has a style name of its own. Victorian eclectic. 
The Victorian Academy remained the school's principal classroom building for nearly half a century. In 1902, the new head of school, Alfred Stearns, responded to long-standing rumors that the building was unsafe by asking Guy Lowell to send an engineer out from Boston to inspect it. When the engineer ripped up flooring in the huge third floor chapel room shown here, he discovered that beams running from the walls that were supposed to overlap, overlap the building's huge main beam by five inches, in fact did so by less than an inch. When Stearns joined him, he remarked that it was a good thing the room was used only for quiet chapel services, since any activity more strenuous than that could have sent the entire building crashing down. Stearns blanched because he had just held a raucous football rally there involving most of the students and many of the faculty with frequent cheers accompanied by rhythmic stomping. For years afterwards, he had nightmares about the entire school suddenly plunging to its death and wondered whether the academy would even have survived such a disaster. Stearns immediately closed the building for emergency repairs that included converting the top floor to a disused attic by removing the huge mansard roof and replacing it with the low hipped roof shown here. In 1810, the Gothic entrance portico was also removed, perhaps in a doomed attempt to make the building look more compatible with the campus becoming increasingly federal and federal revival in style. Structural problems persisted, leading state officials to condemn the building in the mid 1920s, and the academy finally tore it down in 1927. The trustees also commissioned Cummings to design two buildings on the seminary grounds. These turned out much better, at least in part because the single pur purpose each of them served made it easier to, to design a unified exterior. Brecken Hall was Andover's first dedicated library building. Gothic began as a church architecture intended to draw the eyes of worshipers upward toward heaven. So it often worked best on a building that reinforced the inherent verticality of its pointed arches. Brecken's slender massing, its steep roof, the turrets at its corners, and the high central tower with receding buttresses achieved the effect very nicely. The multicolored stonework of its walls and detailing were handsomely Ruskinian. The only discordant note was the suggestion of a mansard roof on the top of the tower. Cummings designed the stone chapel for the seminary, dedicated in 1876 as the first building on the hill intended exclusively for the purpose of a chapel. The alternating light and dark stones of the arches are a trademark Ruskin feature. Despite this building's great width, it achieves a strong sense of verticality thanks to the three pointed arches on the gable end, the tall chimney at the rear, and above all, the long steep roof line that draws the eye up to a soaring steeple atop the tower. The fact that the seminary's stone chapel had a single chimney marked it as probably the first building on the hill to have central heat. In fact, either the original coal fire furnace in the basement or a more powerful later update also provided steam heat to other seminary buildings, making it the hill's first heating plant. By the time Cummings designed the stone chapel, he had already completed his greatest masterpiece, the so-called old, New Old South Church, which stands across the street from the main branch of the Boston Public Library. If like me, you're fond of Ruskin's Venetian Gothic, and you happen to find yourself in Copley Square, be sure to see its recently restored over the top interior. I'm going to save the many interesting houses on the current PA campus for a later talk, but I can't resist pointing out one of my favorite house styles, the American Queen Anne, although inspired by the British style of that name, soon diverged from it to become what is arguably, at least in my mind, 
the first formal architectural style developed in the United States. It was widely popular from the 1880s to the first decade of the 20th century. The massing of a typical American Queen Anne house tends to rise from one side to the other, most commonly from left to right as demonstrated by Churchill House, shown here in its original location facing Main Street, just north of Phillips Street. PA's finest example of Queen Anne is Tucker House. Originally located across Phillips Street from Churchill House, it presented rising facades to both Phillips Street and Main Streets, a very unusual approach. In this photo at its current location off Hidden Field Road, we see what was once the Phillips Street side rising from left to right, starting with the low entry porch at the near corner. On the other side, which once faced Main Street, it rises from right to left, beginning at the same low porch. The cladding is the typical Queen Anne combination of shingles and clapboards. Several surfaces also have flat boards that suggest medieval style half timbering. Other Queen Anne houses may have a bit of American colonial detailing or perhaps a large rounded entrance taken from the Romanesque revival style that was then fashionable for public buildings. But I could go on and on about Queen Anne and we have many other things to cover. Romanesque revival left prominent marks on Andover Hill. Henry Hobart Richardson pioneered this style in his 1877 masterpiece, Trinity Church, which is also located on Boston's Copley Square, like the church we saw before. Only eight years later in 1885, Phillips Academy completed its own little Romanesque revival masterpiece. This modest and often overlooked structure originally called Phillips Hall was the Hill's first dedicated administration building, housing a trustee meeting room and offices for the treasurer of the board of trustees and PA's head of school. It now houses PA's public safety department. In contrast to H.H. H. Richardson's Trinity Church, this building has a subdued color scheme with both its brickwork and brownstone trim in roughly the same tonal range. This is also true of the much grander Romanesque revival building we'll see next. In 1888, the same year it moved Abbott Hall, Abbott Academy also laid the foundation of a structure designed to meet almost every other school need. Draper Hall, completed in 1890, was designed by the Boston firm of Hartwell and Richardson, no relation to H.H. H. Richardson. It was huge. The first floor alone housed a suite for the head of school, a library, study rooms, parlors for socializing, and 16 dormitory rooms. The basement held the original dining hall, kitchen, pantry, and laundry rooms. There were 11 music rooms on the second and third floors, along with many more dorm rooms. Artist studios shared the top of the building under the roof with quarters for live-in service staff. Draper Hall's huge mass and uniform color palette makes its Romanesque features stand out far less than on many other buildings in this style. Even the mortar in the thin joints between the bricks is, excuse me, is a dark color. The Romanesque features themselves are also subdued. Instead of having huge round Romanesque entrances, it has smaller entrances with rounded tops. The turrets on the outer side of the entrances are only minimally adorned, as are the low rounded bays on the inner side of the entrances. Unobtrusive string courses of brownstone or ornamental brickwork provide subtle horizontal lines in various places to moderate the sheer mass of this facade. The gamble roof gable on the left, borrowed from the Queen Anne style, might be expected to clash with the Romanesque elements. Instead, it adds a note of domesticity that contributes to, the, to an overall impression of gracious repose. So do the double hung windows with up to 24 panes in their upper sashes, another Queen Anne borrowing. 
Queen Anne's styling predominated on Draper's planar side and rear elevations, including this massive five-story wing that projected from the back of the south end. Unfortunately, it had to be removed in 1994 because of a host of dangerous structural defense, defects attributed to corner cutting in the original construction, which had to be carried out on a barely adequate budget. A picturesque plethora of Queen Anne hip gables on the virtually unadorned far side of this lost wing broke up what would otherwise have been an overwhelming bare mass. The two-story dining hall with large Georgian windows that we see connected to it down on the first, first floor level was added in 1941. The bare three-story wing to which the dining room connected on the other side was also added in 1941 primarily to house the school's library and reading rooms. Together, the wings and dining hall enclosed a small courtyard graced by the ground floor porch we see on the side of the 1941 wing. After all of these structures were demolished, Draper's main block was exquisitely restored and now houses faculty apartments and administrative offices. Phillips Academy completed another Romanesque revival structure in 1892. The first building on Andover Hill dedicated exclusively to science, it was later named Graves Hall in honor of William Graves, who brought PA science instruction into the 20th century. Graves Hall was built in two sections, starting with this much needed laboratory block completed in 1883. The Stone Academy, Abbott Academy and the 1865 Victorian building were all built with laboratories in the basement. But as the 19th century wore on, the perils of working with volatile chemicals in a confined space below ground level became increasingly obvious. This purpose built laboratory with an interior 31 feet high provided far superior light and ventilation including readily openable windows in the clerestory structure that we see at the peak of the roof. Each lab table also vented through the wall to the cupola at the end of the clerestory, and openings in the wall below the side windows provided even more ventilation. The lab block's architectural style was as much Queen Anne as Romanesque, particularly the large three-part neoclassical window at, at this end. It was the much larger 1892 classroom block that made Graves Hall really Romanesque revival. This is the completed building's impressive front facade. Few people even see it now because most of the PA campus lies to the south and east, making it more convenient to enter the building from the rear. When it was completed, however, the center of campus was still the big Victorian main classroom building that stood just to the north. Built to face that long gone building, Graves now faces only the overgrown plot of land where it used to stand. The entrance bay is a particularly fine example of Romanesque revival styling. The great round archway leading to the recess door was the Romanesque revival's most emblematic feature. Other typical features are the intricate carving on the curved section of stonework at the base of the arch, the gargoyle supporting the balcony of the loggia above and the loggia's columns with their signature combination of influences from both the classical and early medieval periods. While their capitals are a free medieval reimagining of the classic capital of the Corinthian of composite order, the banding below is truer to classical precedent. The fine carving, by the way, may have been done by Italian immigrants, many of whom entered the building trades in this period. Several generations of Italian craftsmen would contribute immeasurably to the quality of magnificent American buildings such as the National Cathedral in Washington. Also note the intricately laid brickwork around the arch and in the corbeling beneath the edge of the roof. The general quality of American masonry reached its highest level in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Academy's next four buildings were small dormitories called cottages, 
Although designed by professional architects, they seem more like vernacular buildings, reflecting only rudimentary knowledge of the historic styles they were intended to evoke. This may indeed be the case, since architectural training emphasizing accurate rendering of many historical styles was still fairly new. A case in point is Andover Cottage. Built in 1892, it was the Academy's last foray into an historically European style before returning to its American roots. The high walls and steep gables reveal that this was supposed to be something like a Tudor style house. But the detailing to back up that aspiration is limited and much of it is generically late medieval rather than specifically Tudor. It includes crudely executed pointed arch windows and the small roof gables, cursory Gothic surrounds at the top of other windows crenellation on the two-story front pavilion, and a, slightly pro a slight projection around the door with a steep faux gable. The result is not unattractive, but at best it merely refers to Tudor style rather than embodying it. The style of the other three cottages sometimes called, uh, sometimes called now at least, neo-colonial, to distinguish it from the far more accurate colonial revival and federal revival, revival styles that would follow. In the 1890s, respect for America's own architectural history was beginning to vie in the minds of US architects and critics with their traditional reverence for European precedent, which was exemplified by Henry Adams's Mont Saint-Michel and Chartres. Americans were only beginning to study the surviving examples of colonial and federal architecture. Later changes to many historic buildings like the Victorian remodeling of Pearson Hall obscured their original features, complicating efforts to understand them. It's therefore no surprise that neo-colonial buildings of the 1890s got things wrong. Draper Cottage's three-story height, hipped roof, slender chimneys, and large unadorned walls, largely unadorned walls, suggest a federal period house. The block-like modillions and the row of smaller blocks called dentals under the edge of the roof are also true to the federal style, as are the Tuscan columns and pilasters of the entry porch. But the brick flat or jack arches above the windows are Georgian, not federal. The walls of a federal period brick house usually rested on a foundation of cut stone. Here, the foundation is field stone with a rough hewn stone cap. The foundation also projects out a bit from the brick wall to form what is called a water table, a distinctly Georgian feature. Federal builders also tended to make the foundations of brick buildings a bit wider than the heavy walls they had to support, but the extra width on a federal building projected into the building, not out of it. But these are all quibbles. The real problem here is fenestration, a fancy term for the shape and placement of windows. Every window except the one over the entry porch should be the same width. The single windows on either side of the first and second floors are out of line with the windows above and look lost in a sea of blank wall. And the three part window over the porch seems to be missing something. Nearby Samaritan house shows how the fenestration looks on, a, on the facade of a real federal house. Every opening except the doorway and the window above it is of uniform width. All of the openings are organized into five bays and the triple opening over the porch is spanned by an arch in typical federal fashion. Prominent Boston architect Alexander Alexander Wadsworth Longfellow, a nephew of the poet, designed both Draper Cottage and the next, two Academy, and the next Academy building, Bancroft Hall, which is shown here at its original site on Phillips Street, not far from the, uh, not, uh, which is now part of the Vista. So this was later on moved over to the West Quad. Longfellow had the best educational credentials of any architect who had ever worked on Andover Hill up to that time. But after, gradu uh, after graduating from MIT, he studied at Paris at the renowned Ecole de Beaux-Arts, generally considered the world's finest architectural school at that time. But he had learned nothing about historic American architecture in Paris. When completed in 1900, 
Bancroft was the largest dormitory the Academy ever built, and its uniform window bays show how much Longfellow had learned in less than a decade since he had designed uh, Draper Cottage. He seems to have intended Bancroft to represent the beginning of a transition from federal to Greek revival. The hipped roof, long side facade, and detailing above the roof edge are all federal, but the squared off entrances topped by cornices are Greek revival. The next three dormitories the Academy constructed, Day, Bishop, and Adams Halls, all built between 1910 and 1912, would also be federal revival buildings with Greek revival entrances. And of course, we see uh, Bishop and Adams Halls here. Like Longfellow, this man, Guy Lowell, also graduated from MIT and studied at the École de Beaux-Arts. And he also studied landscaping and horticulture at Britain's Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew. Lowell is probably best known as the architect of the original neoclassical proportion portion rather of Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. But as Phillips Academy's first official school architect, he designed all but one of the buildings the Academy constructed in the first quarter of the 20th century, the sole exception being 1901 Borden Gymnasium. The École de Beaux-Arts specialized in a particularly grand and highly refined form of neoclassicism known as the Beaux-Arts style. By the end of the 19th century, this had become America's preferred style for great public institutions like the Library of Congress, the New York Public Library, the Boston Public Library, and Columbia University. When PA graduate and archeology span enthusiast, Robert Peabody endowed an archeology span institute at Phillips Academy in 1899, Beaux-Arts was the obvious choice for its new building. And who better to design it than a young Beaux-Arts graduate with a booming architectural practice. The archeology span building had Lowell, that Lowell produced is not obtrusive. It's granite foundation, brick walls, hip roof, and walls under the roof edge complement rather than overshadow the many other academy buildings with similar characteristics. But no other academy building had, has this building's Beaux-Arts detailing clearly intended to indicate that a distinguished institution lay within. A small parapet above the edge of the roof subtly highlights the roof line. Very wide and elaborate brick coining adorns the building's corners. An even wider coining stretches from the, centers of the, uh, from the uh, corners of the central pavilion all the way onto the inner edges of the main wall. The tall entrance is topped by a false stone balcony at the base of a tall window, and above that is a large Baroque escutcheon in the broken pediment. Other stone escutcheons with the founding dates of both the academy and the institute support the pediment's corners. The archaeology building is Andover's only significant example, sorry, Andover's only significant example of such high style architecture, but it's by no means Lowell's greatest contribution to the academy. That was indisputably Samuel Phillips Hall, which is only fitting since Sam Phil would be the centerpiece of the new main campus the Academy was beginning to develop around the old Seminary Row east of Main Street. The removal of Pearson Hall from between Foxcroft and Bartlett opened up the vista from Main Street to the center of this new classroom building. It would therefore require a very striking central feature to give the vista a strong focal point. To achieve that, Lowell took a great stylistic risk. He created a striking central pavilion in the form of an imposing austere Doric temple front worthy of the finest Greek revival building. But at the same time, he made the rest of Sam Phil essentially federal to complement the former seminary buildings. This included the daring decision to install on a stone base above the temple front a tall federal style structure consisting of a wooden tower, lantern and cupola in receding tiers. This was no naive pastiche. Lowell's deep knowledge of historic building styles enabled him to combine them creatively in a daring composition 
that made the most of their respective strengths. For example, instead of just placing a six column porch at the front of the temple pavilion, he drew on an ancient stylistic precedent to do something more subtle. As this photo of the temple of Hephaestus at Athens shows, many ancient Greek temples were peripteral, meaning that instead of just a colonnade in front, they had a single row of columns extending all around the edge of the building to form a sort of wraparound porch. As we can see, the solid stone walls of the temple sanctuary, the actual building part of the building, as, as we might say, are well within the mass of the building behind the columns rather than at its edges. Now let's look more closely at the center of Sam Phil. Lowell, of course, needed a pavilion, not a peripteral temple, but he could suggest the front of a peripteral temple by placing the pavilion's solid granite wall well within its edges, as if it were the sanctuary of an ancient temple, and installing wooden Doric columns on both sides as well as in front. This had several benefits. It made the colonnade look more impressive and its shadowing more dramatic. It provided a conspicuous ceremonial door in the center of what seemed to be a sanctuary, as well as unobtrusive side doors at the back of the colonnade for everyday use. More importantly, it enabled Lowell to inconspicuously continue the granite walls of the sanctuary within the pavilion's colonnade right up through the roof to provide a suitably austere base for the tower, raising it just enough above the temple front's starkly simple pediment to ease the visual transition to the ornamental federal structure above. Now let's consider the wings of the building. If Lowell adorned them with major federal devices, such as blind arches or pilasters, it would have drawn attention away from the intended focal point in the center. On the other hand, if he left them mostly unadorned, they would have seemed drab in comparison to the center section. So he split the difference by applying elaborate window surrounds, but only to the most prominent windows, those on the first floor. He enhanced the apparent height of those windows with a strong triangular pediment above them and a false balustrade below. But he omitted the pediment on the windows nearest the central pavilion to ease the visual transition of the much larger pediment of the temple front. For balance, he also omitted the pediment of the window at the outer edge of each building. This photo of the Unitarian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts may help you appreciate the depth of Lowell's knowledge of historic architectural styles. The steeple of this 1801 federal church differs from the cupola of San Phil in many ways, but they also have a lot in common. This photo of Philadelphia's late Georgian Carpenter's Hall shows false, false balustrades below the windows, much like those below the windows of Sam Phil. Lowell was not making stuff up, but creatively adapting and mixing historical elements based on a thorough understanding of how they were used in the past. This is Charles Adams Platt, who first envisioned moving Pearson Hall to open up the vista to Sam Phil, and then using Pearson and other buildings to enclose the large quadrangle now called the Greener Quad. Unlike Lowell, Platt had no formal training as either an architect or landscape designer. He trained as a landscape painter and etcher under the father of Maxwell Parrish, and then at private institutions in New York and Paris, where he exhibited in the 1900 Paris Exposition. Excellent drawing skills, particularly great deftness in rendering perspective, enabled Platt to educate himself rapidly in landscape design and later in architecture. By the second decade of the 20th century, he had become a highly respected practitioner of both with a distinguished list of clients. Perhaps his most famous building is the Freer Gallery on the Mall in Washington, DC. Beginning with George Washington Hall, Platt designed all of the major buildings that completed the current main campus, except for Lowell's Morse Hall and Andover Inn. Unfortunately, I only have time to discuss Platt's final art academy building, Cochrane Chapel, 
despite his dearth of formal architectural training, Platt also had a deep knowledge of architectural precedents, as witnessed this photo of a Bullfinch church in Lancaster, Mass., whose portico is believed to be the model for the one on Cochrane Chapel. Platt's stock and trade was seemingly unassertive buildings to which he imparted a surprising degree of confident self-possession through his mastery of sight lines and perspective and his judicious application of a few decorative elements selected with a connoisseur's eye. The Oliver Wendell Holmes Library and Addison Gallery are good examples, but Platt also had the confidence to accept a risky challenge. Cochrane Chapel was located across Chapel Avenue from the north end of the Great Lawn to balance Lowell's tall, slender bell tower across Salem Street from its south end. Balancing the bell tower would require a steeple that looked as tall and slender as possible, exactly the opposite of the wide base, blocky brick tower, round classical lantern, and squat cupola that Bullfinch employed here to make this church look more massive than it really is. Platt therefore gave Cochrane Chapel a low hipped roof to visually minimize the apparent mass of the building's main block and shift attention to the smaller central center pavilion to the front. By placing the steeple directly on the front slope of the inconspicuous hipped roof with no intervening structure, he made it seem to rise only from the gable of the center pavilion rather than from the roof of the building as a whole. The relatively small size of the pavilion makes the tall steeple it appears to support look even larger than it actually is, truly a triumph of proportion and perspective. I've loved the view of Cochrane Chapel across the Great Lawn and the view of Sam Phil at the edge of the vista since the first time I laid eyes on them. I love the graceful bell tower, elegant bullfinch hall, serene abbot hall, and indeed all the old campus that the efforts of so many people over more than a century and a half bequeathed to all of us who belong to the academy community today. So it gave me particular pleasure to make my own small contribution to our shared understanding of that glorious history in today's first talk. Now it's time to hear your questions which Terry has kindly been gathering up while I talk. Over to you, Terry. Thank you. Uh, let me just get on here. Okay. So we have a number of questions, uh, as you might well imagine, but there are multiple questions, John. Uh, concerning uh, the movement of buildings. People seem to be astonished that any of these buildings could be moved, uh, Abbott Hall, for instance. Um, how do, can you share with us your insights into how that was done or how complicated uh, the moves were? Um, what have you got for us? Well, um, the answer as with the splendid masonry um, and uh, the general quality of buildings during the period around the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, is Italians. Um, they, 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 these buildings were jacked up by men. Uh, so a, a gang of construction laborers, uh, all each had a jack with a very long metal rod extending from the jack. Somebody blew a whistle, and when that whistle blew, each of those laborers, say 40 of them on a given building like Pearson Hall, turned his jack half a, uh, a quarter turn. Then they'd come around, look, make sure everything was still solid and everything was balanced. Then they'd turn the jack another quarter turn and on and on and on. Once they got the building up, they built massive wooden piers, essentially, uh, stacked up piles of wood that, that had structural strength. And they then laid rails over those, put little sort of carts with tiny wheels, uh, have made out of heavy metal, of course, on the rails, lowered the building down onto those. The building uh, was by this time on a sort of cradle, which they had constructed underneath it. 
They lowered the cradle down onto those, slid it along, and then reversed the process to get the building back down and onto the foundations that had been built in the meantime. Uh, they, they, the quality of that where now some of the lighter, later buildings were essentially rolled along streets. That's how Samaritan House was moved, for example. Um, I hope to, to cover that in a future talk. Uh, one of the talks that I sort of have had in mind is a comparison of Andover and Exeter and the difference in the development of the two campuses. I believe Exeter did a lot less the moving. So that'd be a good example to show you pictures of buildings being moved. What I've never seen so far, it may exist in the archive, I'm gonna to have to talk to Paige about it. I've never seen a picture of a building being turned. I don't know how they did that. So we'll see if by my, uh, by my next talk or the talk after, I'm able to come up with a picture of that as well. But that's essentially how it was done. It was done by hand uh, and it was done very, very slowly. Well, uh... I don't want to slow things down here. Um, I'm going to, uh, we've got a couple of comments uh, regarding your comments about Foxcroft. Um, and we have uh, one comment from a member of the class of 1954, uh, Kenneth McWilliams, who asked uh, if Harvard, and I'm going to pronounce it Stoughton Hall because someone else suggested that the pronunciation needed to be corrected. So I'm just gonna say Stoughton. I have no idea if in fact that is the correct pronunciation, but Ken, Kenneth asks if Stoughton's, if Harvard Stoughton Hall is a close copy of Harvard's earlier Hollis Hall, how do you know that Foxcroft Hall was modeled on Stoughton and not Hollis? And, and he adds, that your, your John's architectural discovery is very interesting and very important and suggests that you should write it up as an article for Andover Magazine. Um, and finally, so, uh, someone else, possibly a couple of people, wondered about the removal of, of, of fourth floors from both Foxcroft and perhaps, uh, there may be another one here, I'm, Bartlett. Sort of, and Bartlett. Why were they taken off? What was the reason for that? So maybe there's a big Foxcroft answer here that you can give us. Well, let's start with the two dorms at Harvard. Um, they were essentially twins, but I'm pretty sure, as a matter of fact, it's, it's almost certain that Foxcroft was copied from what I had called Staunton. I, uh, I'm not a Harvard man, so I don't know the correct pronunciation. Uh, but in any case, um, so how, how do you, Stoughton, is it? Or anyway, however, I'm going to call it Staunton because it's easier. Anyway, um, the um, Hollis Hall was a Georgian structure. It looks different. It, um, it has um, heavy string courses on all sides. Uh, Foxcroft doesn't have that and because Foxcroft is a federal building. Uh, it's only natural they would have copied the brand new building and the federal building because it's in the federal style. Uh, also, Hollis had a different solution for that peculiar problem of running a partition into a bunch of windows. Hollis never connected it to the windows at all. It's hard to believe, but the photographic evidence is very clear. They just had a regular window there, which could be open from both sides, apparently. I saw one picture uh, where somebody apparently stuffed something in the window because he wanted his window closed. The guy on the other side of the partition wanted his open. Uh, so he just stuck something in there to block his window so it had seemed to be closed. Anyway, um, so uh, Hollis Hall basically did not have the structure in the window that we see both on Staunton and on uh, Foxcroft later on. So that's how we know that Foxcroft was copied from Staunton. Now, in terms of the removal of the floors, uh, this was before the era of historic preservation. Um, Sam Phil is not a particularly tall building. 
Uh, and it would have been behind these two great four-story tall buildings. It would have been framed between them. The library and the art gallery are also lower because they sit on lower ground. They're not on the terrace that was built for, uh, for Bartlett Chapel and then for Bartlett Hall. So it, they looked a bit awkward. And it was before the era of historic preservation They'd also had, of course, that big fire in Bartlett Hall, and they were worried about fire safety, uh, and they had put ugly fire escapes on both buildings. So they thought the buildings would look a lot better, they would, would pass fire inspection with no problem, and they would look much more in tune with the new buildings that had been built around them if you just took off the top floor. That was probably Platt's idea, um, and remember, he's the man who was so strong on perspective and lines uh, and sight lines. Uh, and from a purely aesthetic uh, point of view, he was right. But from an historic preservation point of view, can you imagine taking a building, an iconic building that's, that's well over a century old, uh, pushing two centuries, uh, and just shaving off the top floor? We wouldn't dream of doing that sort of thing nowadays. There's one other comment. There's an interesting comment here from an um, uh, 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 audience member named Lucy, who, who said she was fascinated by the uh, difference in terms of interior and exterior relationships between Foxcroft and Bartlett or Pearson, uh, noting that in with Foxcroft, you had the exterior with the divided middle window, but in Bartlett, um, they chose to hide what was going on in the interior in favor of a coherent facade. Do you have any comment uh, beyond that? In, in, I, I, okay, so you're saying in, in Bartlett Chapel, um, not Bartlett Hall. Yes, um, I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, and, and um, of course, Bartlett Chapel now being Pearson Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they basically, Bullfinch basically had a problem in um, Pearson Hall. Uh, he had to squeeze the stuff in, there had to be three classroom buildings, and there had to be a massive chapel that was in University Hall, he could put it in the middle because University Hall is very long and you could just stick the classrooms on either of the wings up and, you know, stack them up three stories tall, but you couldn't do that. So he basically had to have an awkward structure. But the federal style, like the Georgian style before it, placed a tremendous value on symmetry. So he also had to have symmetry. So, and it was not uncommon in the federal style, uh, in, in both the Georgian and the federal, to have false doors. One of the things that confused people for years about Staunton, Staunton, however you call that thing, uh, what it confused them for years was it had a false center door because they had a pavilion there. They wanted to make it look like a pavilion. They wanted to make it look impressive. And a pavilion only looks right if it has a door. Why else would you have a pavilion? So they put a false door on. And for years, people were confused by that, not realizing it was a false door. Um, but the plans clearly show that it was. So uh, let's see, um, now in terms of when we get to, to Bartlett Hall, the dormitory, of course, there it has a brick wall. It also has a center petition, just like Foxcroft, although the layout was probably more like the two bedroom, one and shared study layout uh, that we saw later at Harvard. But um, so they basically tied the center petition into a wall as any sane builder would. Uh, Harvard apparently with Hollis wanted to have it both ways. They wanted an impressive structure that with a central pavilion and what looked like a door, but they want, also wanted the transverse corridors, which were the cheapest way to build the interior of a dorm, uh, and they wanted a central divider. So they basically split the difference and wound up with a real mess, but I'm very grateful they did because if they had not messed it up and had not uh, Whoever made the decision for Foxcroft messed it up that way. We'd never know that Staunton was the, was the model for Foxcroft. So uh, I've got a, a rather long uh, uh, question uh, about um, that uh, structure that we 
no begins with the letter S. But <laughs> yeah. How do you pronounce it, Jerry? I was told early on uh, uh, in the first session that it's pronounced Stoughton, but Stoughton. I, I will remember that henceforth. But I'm not saying that's correct. Um, but anyway, uh, Stephen Kosovac, Kosovac, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that. We'll call uh, him Stephen Stoughton. <laughs> Stephen K. <laughs> uh, uh, he says, uh, your close attention to the compositional tensions in these buildings is remarkable, exceptional, and very exciting to listen to. I'd like to ask you about the way you characterize the placement of a partition in the middle of the window bay at, at S Hall. You said it suggests incompetence on the part of the planner or the architect, but the beautiful plan that you showed included the study carols that made the rooms to either side decidedly symmetrical, each with two window bays. The resolution of the half windows in the carols and the shape of the rooms they serve is so well composed. Yes. Moreover, the, moreover, the placement of the window in the middle of the window permits the central portion of the facade to be five bays and thus hierarchical. Yep. The question is whether the bisection of the window is evidence of incompetence, the result of ingeniousness, or an error caused by the imperative for exterior hierarchical symmetry, excellently corrected by the introductional of the carols inside. That doesn't, that sounds more like a statement. I guess there's a- <laughs> Well, no, actually, uh, I'm, I'm asking you to choose, that. You, He's asking you to choose one yeah. of the three, I think. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm glad he asked that question because I, what I said was no competent builder would build a building that way. But I didn't say architect. The builder wants good structure. He's not gonna try, try to tie a wall into a window because walls don't tie into glass. It's as simple as that. But an architect has a lot of demands. And as my questioner quite rightly pointed out, my questioner, by the way, seems to have even better knowledge of architectural detailing than I do. Uh, but as he pointed out, um, the architect is under different pressures. He has, he's been told to make the outside of a building look a certain way. And in Hollis Hall, in colonial times, and Hollis being the model for all of this, um, he was told we want, on the long side of the building, we don't want it to look dull. We want a pavilion and we want the appearance that this is building is centered. But at the same time, they wanted the, 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 the most cost-effective way of laying out a dormitory, which is transverse corridors with a partition between different each of the blocks served by the corridors. And in this building, there were going to be two corridors. So how do you do that? You put on a false, uh, a false pavilion, you put on a transverse roof with a pediment over the pavilion, and you put in a false door and then you lay it out. So this building actually was modeled uh, loosely. There was an earlier Staunton Hall, which also had two sections like this with transverse corridors. It was modeled on that. The earlier Staunton Hall was not as deep, but that's essentially what they wanted. They wanted the best, most efficient form of dormitory that you could build most cheaply and that would admit the greatest amount of light to the corridors but they also wanted it to look nice. And the architects split the difference. And that's, so I would say a competent builder would not do that, but a competent architect could very well uh, do that. I mean, look at all the, all the hand springs that Bullfinch had to do in Pearson Hall. So you're, it's absolutely right. I was not intending to malign whoever the architect of Hollis Hall was. Uh, the architect, by the way, Stoughton, however you pronounce that thing, was um, attributed to Bullfinch. I don't know with what authority, I haven't looked into it. Uh, Bullfinch must have just ground his teeth at having to make a copy of it, of, of Hollis Hall, but they paid him back by letting him design University Hall, even though they didn't give him his cupola. 
So we're we're down to our last five minutes. I've got a bunch of other questions. So I'm gonna let's think of this as sort of a quick one. You, I don't think they're yes or no questions, but as short an answer as you can, and we'll get through as many as possible. Uh, our classmate Danny Samuels, who, as you know, is a builder, a real architect. Our, yeah, he's a real architect. Says, I guess this just shows how little we quote unquote, modern and also postmodern architects know about our inherited history. I think that he's meaning that he's learned something. <laughs> that is indeed true because we don't educate architects. You know, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts type architects were, get, were educated essentially in the Beaux-Arts style and they could do very well with that. But people like Lowell and uh, Longfellow had to educate themselves to a great extent by doing a lot of historical research and going out there just as Palladio did with ancient Roman buildings and measuring them and looking at them and figuring them out. Uh, that knowledge has, is now resides with architectural historians. I think we could profit a great deal if we reintroduced it into the uh, curriculum for architects as well. Sarah Gregg uh, uh, tells us that she lived in Draper Hall for two years, uh, that they had an art class on the fourth floor, but nothing else. And they were not allowed to go into the upper areas of Draper as those areas were a fire trap. Yes, um, there were, Draper was built on too tight a budget. And unfortunately it showed. It's a good thing that it was able to be, that the front block was able to be restored even though everything behind had to be torn down. But yeah, uh, that was quite early on. Uh, there were restrictions about using it up there because they were afraid that uh, you couldn't evacuate it in the event of a fire. It wasn't designed with fire safety in mind. You're under a great roof with a tremendous amount of timber. Uh, yeah, it, it got tricky, unfortunately, with Draper, but the, the at least the front part of it was saved, which is the most important part, and the, the restoration is exquisite. Uh, Ken McWilliams is back, and he oh, wonders... Uh, Jerry, let, me, let me interrupt just a oh. second. Anybody who wants to, email me at jjpatrick3 at yahoo.com. I'll be happy to field questions. Go ahead, Terry. So... Uh, Ken McWilliams has got another uh, query, and it was, uh, why was William Barlett of Newburyport inclined to help Andover? Because Newburyport's own conservative Congregationalists had thought about founding their own seminary, and a lot of work had to be done, including, surprisingly enough, he's not known as a diplomat, but Elephalet Pearson made trip after trip, 20, 30 trips, whatever, uh, back and forth to Newburyport, negotiating, uh, talking, comparing. Uh, they, they represented slightly different forms of Congregationalist conservatism. He finally talked the Newburyport people into joining up. Uh, and that's how Bartlett and a good deal of Newburyport money came on board to build the seminary. And you won't believe this, but Paul Tessier, or Tessier, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced it, Paul, T-E-S-S-I-E-R, Tessier, I'm guessing. But Paul has decided to give us a short history lesson on Stoughton. Oh. And his history lesson is this, the town of Stoughton, Massachusetts was named for William Stoughton, first lieutenant governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It rhymes with doe and though, but not <laughs> ought or thought. And he adds as a fun fact, William Stoughton also presided over the Salem witch trials. Well, I grew up in Methuen, Massachusetts and we called the town Staunton. Now, maybe the people in the town call it something else, but I don't know. Uh, we've got about a minute to go, John. Um, I, I would say on behalf of our audience, uh, we can't thank you enough for the work that you've done in putting this together, uh, the passion you bring to this, um, and the fact that you're continuing to uh, 
do more work and we can look forward to more uh, presentations. Someone is asked, when are you going to do the next one and what's it going to cover? So why don't we end with your answer to that question? That's all to be determined. I'm going to have to talk to the folks in the alumni office about that. And I'm also going to have to see what I can find out when. But probably, I would guess, sometime in the early fall, probably. Well, again, we thank you for everything. And um, I think uh, if our uh, monitor is still on, we can say that uh, so long. And you can say goodbye, too. Well, goodbye, and thank you all for coming, and thank you, Terry. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you both. We'll say goodbye now. Have a good one. <laughs>